know how's everybody feeling? We can go ahead or we can... Yeah, I'm fine. Full ahead. Rational thought is the sort of thought God himself orders your thoughts because your thought was created by him. Guilt feelings are always a sign that you do not know this. They also show that you believe you can think apart from God and want to. Every disordered thought is tended by guilt at its inception and maintained by guilt in its continuance. Guilt is inescapable by, inescapable by those who believe they order their own thoughts and must therefore obey their dictates. This makes them feel responsible for their errors without recognizing that. By accepting this responsibility, they are reacting irresponsibly. If the sole responsibility of a miracle worker is to accept the atonement for himself, and I assure you that it is, then the responsibility for what is atoned for cannot be yours. The dilemma cannot be resolved except by accepting the solution of undoing. You would be responsible for its effects of all your wrong thinking if it could not be undone. The purpose of the atonement is to save the past in purified form only. If you accept the remedy for disordered thought, a remedy whose efficacy is beyond doubt, how can its symptoms remain? So that's a great, great paragraph. We Mary and I were discussing that this morning in the sense that it seems when you're on the surface and you believe you're a person that I'm guilty because these guilt thoughts seem to be associated with, for example, not putting my children through college mm -hmm. or, you know, guilt feelings about, well, I've got this job and there's about 42 people relying on me and this atonement, accepting the atonement sounds real nice to you, but... If I go and accept the atonement and follow you, am I going to let down mm -hmm. 42 people at work? Or you can see where the guilt feelings are always associated with form things. And what he's saying here is that if you believe you can order your own thoughts, that's where the guilt's coming from. It doesn't have anything to do with the roles and letting people down and so on and so forth. It has to do with ordering your thoughts. And that, again, the problem's in the mind. The problem is judgment. The problem is good, fe great feathers, good feathers, mediocre feathers, so-so <laughs> feathers, and poor feathers, or whatever. How have you constructed that, that? That's an ordering. That, that there's a a divine order that's beyond the levels and the, the hierarchy that you have constructed or the ego constructed. really need to think too is again accepting the dilemma cannot be resolved except by accepting the solution of undoing and, and what precedes that sentence is that the responsibility for what is atoned for cannot be yours each is saying don't accept responsibility for the wrong mind in the sense that um, if, if it was irreversible, then you wouldn't be guilty. But the right mind is the solution for the wrong mind. The right mind is accepting the fact that, oh, God orders my thought. God created me. He orders my thought. I, can, I will gladly accept that. And I will not <laughs> accept responsibility for all this ordering and judging. I choose to raise every concept and every judgment that I believe in to the light and to to say there it is the solution I what I did it has been corrected I'm not responsible for the error all I'm responsible for is accepting the solution that's good news <laughs> and we're talking about ordering of thoughts okay are we talking about putting in order thoughts that there would be only be the one thought with God so there would be no order and are we also talking about commanding thoughts in terms of order? Well, I would say that when it says God himself orders your thoughts, it's speaking about there's some kind of divine order with creation in the kingdom of heaven that has completely been dissociated and denied. Mm -hmm. And the step back towards becoming aware of what that 
divine order is, or creation, is forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Is not ordering all these images. If I believe that some images are more important than other images, then how can they all be equally unreal if some are more higher or more important than others? So to me, that's the, the whole step of the process of undoing is starting to see, oh, I don't want to continue to arrange and order the images because that prevents my awareness of forgiveness, which is that they're all equally unreal. And then that, that is also preventing me from the step that comes beyond forgiveness, which is becoming aware of the divine order of creation and spirit. Another word for ordering might be ranking. That's what I was saying, is a ranking of thoughts, but ranking, then divine order of thoughts would just be one thought that wouldn't need a rank. It is the highest thought. So there's no order that needs to, you don't need to put anything in order. I mean, it's... There's only one. There's only one. And ranking always involves at least two. Right, exactly. So that's what I was saying. There's no... But uh, if, if we're doing any ordering, then we've got, we're obviously put in something other than God in there. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. The arranging the images, in mm -hmm. other words, the divine order, um, you, a lot of times it's capitalized and it's, it's referring to something that it has to do with creation. It couldn't have anything to do with the illusion. I mean, you could use the, kind of a metaphor and say that um, once. I realize that there's no ordering, and they're always really unreal, then I just accept what's on the screen. I mean, the screen's the screen. Then, in one sense, all things work together for good. You know, as it says in the Bible, for them that love the Lord. For them that are in the right mind, all things work together for good. But that's still kind of metaphorical in the sense that, that as if there still are separate things that are working together. <laughs> on the screen, you know. To me, the divine order, the ultimate sense of the capital D, is, just has, must have to do with the kingdom of heaven. And, in one sense, he's saying again that there, he says, there aren't any levels in heaven. And then he goes on to say, the only levels there are, <laughs> as he says, there aren't any levels, is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He said, but those are not levels like you have levels of perception, you know, different hierarchies down in this, in this world. He said, because the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are one in spirit, there is no sense where one begins and where one leaves off, which is unlike the levels of this world. So, again, I think there may be something to do with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit that has there's a divine ordering of thought. There certainly is is a creator, a prime creator, in which all thoughts spring from. That would be God. And there certainly seems to be a line of creation, even, because he, he says that the Father created the Son, Christ, and that the Son has creation. But you're not aware of your creation, because you're not aware of yourself. <laughs> and when you remember yourself, you also remember your Father, and yourself, and your creation plural. Mm -hmm. Don't try to figure that one out. <laughs> the little problems that you keep and hide become your secret sins because you did not choose to let them be removed for you. And so they gather dust and grow until they cover everything that you perceive and leave fair to no one. Not one right do you believe you have, and bitterness with vengeance justified and mercy lost condemns you as unworthy of forgiveness. The unforgiven have no mercy to bestow upon another. That is why your sole responsibility must be to take forgiveness for yourself. different form of sole responsibility. Instead of accept the atonement, now it's just take forgiveness. Take 
your right hand. A question came to my mind before we go on, and because I know when I had talked to you back on the phone before we came, you had said that one of the issues, because I said, what are some of the things that you've been discussing that you'd like to go into, and one of them was you said responsibility. And I guess I was just wanting to know what, what thoughts you had about that before and in what context that had come up or what what your questions or your concerns were pertaining to responsibility. Um, uh, I think it's real tied in for me with my child, the responsibility. That's the key one. I don't really can't even take it beyond that. You know, I'd be, I'd be doing to say this, you know, where I work. To, to make the job or to make people um, feel responsible there so much weight and responsibility there. Um, less with my my family, my immediate family, my father. Um, I don't know, I, I can see the levels of you know, responsibility. But I also um, Yeah, I just, uh, you know, I was like, I am, um, I think I need to come for this word. Trip down to Ohio. Yeah, it's not a trip. Let me get more clear first before I share. Yeah. A question you might ask that would be helpful would be, you know, if I would answer this call, mm-hmm. and what areas or in what ways does it seem like I would feel like I was being irresponsible. And that would be a way of kind of unearthing where I think my responsibility is mm-hmm. in this world. Right. Yeah, it does seem to be relatively tied to my daughter. But there's quite a you know, I think I can work around that. <laughs> you know, it, it seems like it shouldn't be overgetting around it kind of answer. So. Other people can respond because I think just like you're saying to your family, I can imagine the same mm-hmm. scenario with mine, just why you know I basically share it very little. I mean, they just, they're going to take it to you, <laughs> they're just going to put it right in your face. And uh, uh, I think I felt that I need to be in clear space before I was sure to. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, it was real helpful to me when you were explaining what, when you were going deeper into Buddhism and your brother and it was his friend mm-hmm. who were clobbering at the restaurant you were feeling and it was like that, that and, and I said, how did you handle it? And you said, well, that's a good question, I need to look more at that, you know? Yeah, it's the only way to diffuse that because it was a definite attack. Mm-hmm. Two girls and uh, both sides, yeah. But but I knew it came from love, you know, and I. Mm-hmm. And that's the hard part because that there that's still a part that we identify with. Mm-hmm. And even with this, I know it's going to be the same kind of experience. Like, you know, it feels like an attack, but I I know. At least they think their intentions are good. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I'm yeah. just getting back to the perception because, you know, to, to share the idea when someone is saying things is, that's a good question or I want to go in. It, it could be from a beautiful defenseless place like you were just talking about, about being a student or I'm learning, as you're saying, of not feeling like in every single encounter you have to um, know the complete awareness of the atonement, mm-hmm. but to say, hmm, thank you for for raising that. That's something that I'm starting to look closely into, and I maybe never have thought of it that way or this or that from a very sincere place. Mm-hmm. That way it wouldn't even be of like sending off an attack or something else, but just you are my